Welcome, everybody. I'm Rich Rosso, Director of Financial Planning for RIA Advisors. We really appreciate you being here. And there are these things that happen called outliers or these weird things that happen that cause havoc. Like, you know, an ice storm can never happen in Texas. Or like some friend of mine would say, well, I'll do that when you can make a snowball in Texas. Well, we did make a snowball in Texas. What's really important is I have the expert. I have the expert for you, Randy Lemon. Randy Lemon is the garden guru. And Randy, if you, I'm sure over, over two decades has been with Garden Line on 740. I'm a big Randy Zellin, uh, Lemon fan. I guess I'm a lemon head. Um, I've read all his books. Thanks to him, my lawn is green today, which is very different from what it was a few weeks ago. Why we're doing this is we are going to make sure that you have the right information to get your gardens in shape. So I will have questions. I think they'll address yours. Um, Randy will share, I think, what he thinks is most important for you all to know right now when it comes to recovery. And Randy, you've been writing like a demon. You've been writing all, all these articles. You've been on all these stations, doing all these Zooms, just trying to help people get back in shape. Isn't it amazing when you look at the weather today compared to what we were just, like what, five weeks ago? <laughs> I mean, exactly. It's crazy. It's we were done with the freeze February 20th. So that doesn't mean everything started working right again. So it really is about the 24th of February. We were able to kick things in. If you think about it, that's only been one month. Yeah, only a month. And there are still people cutting. I, as I go through my neighborhoods, people are cutting down, cutting off the, 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 the fawns on their sago palms, going through all this. So what should we be doing right now for our lawns in overall when it comes to i know you have the schedule but what should we be doing here based on the stress that we've seen in all types of lawns well that's been part of my ringing the bell i've done lately on the air and in my consulting business and that has everything to do with you we treat this march as if it's february on a normal fertilization schedule and you know how good the fertilization schedule works so there's this balance, and I just did a tip sheet this morning that went out uh, via our KTRH.com weekly blog that said March is the new February in 2021. And so the point being to give everybody carte blanche to do everything that needs to be done to really revive that grass. And part of what is reviving that grass for the last four weeks, I've been encouraging everybody to rake their yards more than they ever have before. Get the dead grass, get the dead leaves from the trees nearby out. And that way, when you open it up to this schedule, this arsenal that's going to come behind it, February, there's three things to do if you've never done them before. And everybody that tells me they did it right before the freeze, I've been trying to encourage them to just kick it all back in because that freeze did eliminate the effectiveness of things like pre-emergent herbicide, early green up fertilizer, and even the trace minerals, trace elements. So trace elements, even if you composted, Say, say you composted before, and that's what people should be doing is composting and aerate, aeration, which you talk about a lot, right? Compost down before the freeze. They had the first lawns back, I promise. But um, oh. aeration and compost top dressing are hard to come by for two reasons right now, unless you're a true do-it-yourselfer, and that's usually who I talk to anyway. Um, you can go out and rent a coloration machine. You can, If you have a friend or yourself has a pickup truck, you can go get you know a cubic yard of the right compost to put down or get several bags out of it, the right nursery or garden center. The point being, we have to improve the soil. We have to get it back in check. The freeze hurt the soil. The freeze hurt everything fertilization wise. And so we're trying to treat this February as this March as the new February, which doesn't mean it shuts down next week on Wednesday or whatever. I'm just trying to get everybody back in the mindset that we are in that window of everything starting on the fertilization schedule again. But eventually you will, back to your point, your question, you will have to get aeration or compost top dressing or both, one or the other or both. I, I'm good with that. Just get busy with it. You can rent the core aeration machine. You can hire companies out, but make sure that you are the one that's buying the compost that they're going to put down. 
Excellent. And I see your article. It's out there on the Internet. March in 2021, March is the new February. So you all should go to that article because to Randy's point, and Randy always mentions this, and I use this in a financial article, it's all about the soil. Everything comes down to the soil. And Randy just said something that scared me. He says the soil is damaged. It's like pet cemetery. The soil is sour, right? You're telling me that the soil is spoiled, so we actually have to nurture it now from literally from the ground up. Um, and that's why you wrote this piece. So it's a very good piece. I just went through some of it. One question we got is, how do you know if, a, and again, I'm a fruit tree is not my thing. How do you know if a fruit tree is dead? That's one of the well, questions we got. It depends on the fruit tree. I mean, in question, are we talking peaches, plum, pear family of plants? Or are we talking citrus? So I'd really like to know specifically, we lost a lot of citrus that weren't protected, but the citrus that were protected around the trunk have all survived very well. And we're just pruning those back until we see green, we stop. We feed, we aggressively feed for the next six to eight months and catch it back up. That's another great tip sheet that came out two weeks ago at KTRH.com. Yeah. And you can also find it on Facebook, but it really has everything to do with focused fertilizing and aggressive feeding. And I don't mean meanly. I mean, we're packing in another fertilization. So we're getting aggressive about the feeding schedule. And instead of maybe something being fed twice in a year, like azaleas, we're feeding them a third time this year to really bounce them back. But the key to success in focused feeding and forced feeding or aggressive feeding right now on any plant is that you have to follow that up with a liquid drench of something semi-organic or mostly organic. So once you put a synthetic fertilizer down or a very specific, let's use the azalea food as the example, I want you to drench it in with a watering can and anything liquid organic and that tip sheet about focused feeding and fertilizing, which is also in the book that Richard is going to get you guys. It really stresses the importance of buffering that synthetic fertilizer to do everything to build up the root system strength. And that liquid organic along with that fertilizer works together, really build up root strength. Excellent. So it's almost like feed. Okay, I fed my azaleas and we've got a couple of questions when you get to one does include azaleas. My azaleas used to be robust. Now they look sort of skeletal, but what I, the buds are great. So I fed them and then I fed them again. And that really seems to have worked. Now it's going to take a while for the, them to sort of get hardy again. They look like someone that's lost 200 pounds. You know, they were all thick and now they're that's sort of. That's why we do the aggressive of, focused feeding on especially the azaleas right now. But you can still prune them. And if you do the focused feeding, the pruning is up to you how much you want to take down. I know a lot of people are using this opportunity to get their bigger azaleas down in size. This is the year to do that because we can prune it by more than half if we absolutely have to. So here's the question, and I'm not going to go in order here so everybody who's listening, we got them all. Are azaleas, I say yes, only because it's worked for me, are azaleas hardy enough to survive the cold? Are they good plants for use in climate? And if they are, where would you buy these? I know you're not a big fan of big box stores. I don't care where you get them as long as you think it's a good deal. Um, I send people okay. to independent nurseries and garden centers because I know they're going to get help. Somebody who's new to the area, somebody who's got questions. You're not going to get your questions answered at a big box store. They barely have one person running a register, much less having people walking around answering your horticultural questions. So it really depends on where you live to where I'd send you. But if it's an independent nursery, mom and pop open operated type nursery business, that's where I go to. Now, there are some what I call mass merchandisers out there, and those are the chain of garden centers. Uh, they'll have great deals and you, they'll always have multiples of what you need. But again, there's not anybody walking and talking with you on the mass merchandisers. Big box stores, you'll never find it. Mass merchandisers, if you know what you need going in, that's it. I shop there a lot because I know what I need going in. But same thing with box stores. I'm, I'm not going to the box stores due to my horticultural shopping because they don't even have an, a horticulturist on staff. The nurseries and garden centers do. Did I answer your question? So, I where think to get, so, but, but there's, it really depends on where you like, live. Where to get you did where you live, but look for an independent or a, or a chain that's sort of independent to your point. Find someone who's going to help you understand how to plant them and do the right thing. He's a specialist. Exactly. But, so, but azaleas seem to me had been, all of mine lived. Maybe that's a coincidence, but yes. I go around my neighborhood they, and they've the all The only lived. ones that didn't live, that's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up. 
stick with old southern indica azaleas, those formosa type of azaleas. You do not need to ever invest in what they call, well, I can't even think of the name anymore, but the ones that are supposed to bloom multiple times throughout the year, and uh, encore azaleas. Every, it seems like every single one of them fail in our soils down here, and they, they may get blooms a couple of times a year, but they look wretched throughout the year because they're mostly leafless throughout the year. So stay away from the encore azaleas if you're gonna start azaleas. And one other really quick important thing, how you plant them, you just brought that up a second ago, how you plant azaleas is key to success. You have to get and make a res, raised bed that you're going to do nothing but yaya yeah, yeah, plants. I'll explain that if you want me to. But we're going to spread that root system out. So from the bottom, spreading it out, plant it so that the roots are going laterally. If you do that, azaleas will establish, establish perfectly for you. If you take a container out of that container and you dig a hole the size of that container and you just throw it in our existing soil, it won't work here. What's your rule again? Twice the, what's your rule? Oh, that's for tree for planting. planting. Raised beds, you know, so, the idea is you spread the root system out of almost anything, but things like roses and azaleas, okay. absolutely critical for their root systems to start going sideways as opposed to being wrapped in a clay hole because you just shotgun shelled that planting. Yeah, especially with our soil. So what are the, uh, and again, I've had the Encore azaleas, they all died. They, none of them lasted. Big, big lesson. Then I bought them, put them in, listened to you say, don't buy them, and it was too late. Um, what are the best low-maintenance plants for a beach house? <laughs> You're asking a guy who's had ownership in two beach houses I know. for the last 25 I know. years. Don't have one anymore. Um, I don't take care of landscapes down in Galveston, so I don't really know. I can tell you one. But it, it okay. got damaged pretty hardy in this harsh in this last frost. But you see it all over the island. It's the best low maintenance shrub and it gives you cute little gardenia like flowers. But it's called the natal plum, N-A-T-A-L-P-L-U-M, natal plum. I'll also tell you natal that plum. variegated gingers work great down there on the island. You just have to make sure you get enough soil and it's not just sand that these plants are planted in. And I mean, I honestly did not take care of any landscape. We eliminated a landscape in the second beach house we ever owned because when I got to the beach house, the last thing I wanted to do was my job again. I understand, but you gave it some good choices. I would also think plastic plants would work, but okay. don't worry about those. Uh, Listen to you. <laughs> oh, Excuse me. How long should I wait? Here's a question from one of our wonderful people sitting in on the line here. How long should I wait to see if my plants will come back from the cold? Well, we actually should have started with this, Richard. You knew as well as I do. I have this nine rules of freeze recovery. And while That's right. one is done past 30 days later, it talks about getting the mushy, gushy, ooey and gooey stuff out of there. Well, that stuff has long since dried up in the last month but then everything else applies. And we teach you, or we talk you through going out and testing the bark, making cuttings, taking pruning shears and pruning a little, not my finger, but pruning the uh, twig. And you look for green just inside the bark. There's other ways to check for green by scraping the bark with like a pocket knife. And I've found many live citrus trees that were protected well enough by just showing the people with a little pocket knife on these consultations I do, hey, that lime tree's still alive and you didn't believe it. So there have been happy moments and there have been some sad moments on these consultations. But if a plant is going to come back, it should be showing signs of life right now. I will tell you out of firsthand experience today, even though we, we know plants like oleanders and viburnums and uh, Japanese blueberries got toasted by this, that we know they're dead all the way down to the root system. Whether they come back from the root system is going to be questionable, but I saw a viburnum today that was coming back from the root system, but it was a huge viburnum. It had been there for eight or nine years, so it's going to be a good four or five years before that viburnum coming back from the root system is up against the fence and over the fence for barrier protection, so that doesn't make sense. That's why we're trying to tell people on those big shrubbery that got really toasted and they're down. There's no life until you get to the root system. Might as well just dig that whole thing up if you want to replace something that's got some size right away. But let's go back to the question. I know how to do a long answer or something like that, but it really is. You have to go back out there and do some tests on the bark and see. 
And if you need to read those nine rules of freeze recovery, you can get that at randylemon.com, L-E-M-M-O-N, because you've got to apply those rules. That's the only way we know whether something alive or dead. And I, I want you to get the humor out of this, Richard, and everybody else listening. It has been interesting, the thousands of email questions I've got, people trying to send pictures. So they send me a picture of a dead-looking shrub. Can you tell me if this is going to live or not? <laughs> like, how am I supposed to tell you that by a picture, first of all? Because we have those nine rules, and they're all about do it yourself or get out there, double check, and you might be surprised what life you find. I mean, I was telling people what to do right away that listen to the radio show, and everybody that got out there trimmed back, got rid of the mushy, ushy, gooey, did all the lawn care properly stuff. And it is fun to see them bragging with pictures now what they've done 30 days later because they're just following this kind of advice. But God, you don't even get me started on that, Richard. But listen, to your point, you've got to cut it back or check for green. I mean, I had to cut right. back quite a bit, and I found signs of life. And even though it's going to take, gosh knows, I may not even be here by the time they come back. But um, I see the green. Uh, so that's really a good sign. And I know I have to just be patient. I'm not going to have the prettiest palm trees, garden. By the way, Unless palm trees are the worst because we're going to have to wait for months. We may not know about them for at least two more months. Well, we'll talk about those. I've got some nubs in the yard, as I call them. I've named them nubby, nub. I got, I got names for them. Um, so um, our rosemary, his question, our rosemary plants had some green, but since the storm, they turned gray. And uh, are those going to come back or do we need to pull those? Uh, that would be hard for me to answer without actually seeing what she's seeing. But yes, rosemary should have survived the freeze. Some of them didn't get burnt at all, but a lot of it did get burnt. If the whole plant has an overall gray look to it, that sounds like it's sick more than that freeze got to it. Um, so I'd have to see what that looks like. And again, another reason to find mom and pop nurseries and garden centers is take a cutting on something like that, run it into right. a pair of extra pair of eyes. Usually there's ways to find answers that way, as opposed to, you know, going into a big box store, standing there and holding your plant sample and getting no attention whatsoever. But the, with the rosemary, that's not looking so hot. Just prune it back by two thirds, yeah. maybe. And let's see if we can generate some new growth that's going to green up. So maybe to your point for the person who asked this question, one, you take a cutting, bring it to an independent nursery, have them assess it. Two, cut it back if it looks unhealthy. Um, it's not going to it's not going to be for it's not going to look good for a while, but it might come back. Um, do you cut back oleander? If so, how long should you wait if you haven't done it yet? And you can wait till they're supposed to be pruned in October. It's actually relevant this year because all the top nine tenths are dead. They'll probably come back from the root system, but it's going to be several years before they're of size again, if they were a nice size oleander to begin with. But I've noticed, and I, I think it's going to be across the board, a lot of landscape companies because they just, they don't have the resources to replant these right now. Things like oleanders and sago palms are being left alone because they know they're dead, but they don't want to have to remove them yet when they can't find replacement plants because people are just buying them. It's It's been crazy at the nurseries and garden centers for a good reason in a fun way. But as soon as a truck comes in, it's like, you know, f ants to the sugar. <laughs> it's they're, phew, Everybody's just going in to get what's available because there's so much to replace out there. I couldn't even get into plants for all seasons. It, the whole place was... I couldn't find a parking space. I mean, it's crazy. Um, Indian hawthorn and bottle brush are fully those brown. Are two of those, full of they're toast all the way down. Maybe yeah. they'll come back from the root systems. But like big bottle, I have so many people on the consultations I've been doing bottle brush walls for, and they were beautiful. And there's a plant that gets above fence line for barrier protection. So your neighbors don't have to see you playing croquet in your backyard, that kind of shrub and to see them all you know it took years to get up there and now it's dead all the way to the root system and they want it to come back from the root system but i feel like a a, a psychological counselor i'm going to talk to people i say like, you you don't understand how many years it's going to take to get back to what you were achieve, wanting to achieve so dig everything out and start over and i mentioned japanese blueberries and viburnum oleanders and what we were just talking about the bottle brush have been the top five they're pretty much dead, and you really want to wait for them to come back from the root system for the next five to seven years? Not worth it. 
that's the tough part. So the question was, should I cut them to the ground? And I think your answer is yes, but how long are you going to wait? I really can. They're fun. Uh, They are pretty fast grower, but to get, you know, nice size where they were before the freeze, it's going to take five, seven years easy. And like uh, the viburnums and the Japanese blueberries, it's going to take that seven to nine years because they're grown for a couple of years before they were nice sized tree form Japanese blueberries that everybody's used as accents on corners and everybody's corners of houses. And those things, they look like dead shaped Christmas tree shaped plants oh, and rounded ones too, all over the greater Houston area. So it's sad. I agree. I get it. Next one is my fruit tree, queen palm, sago palm and other shrubs look dead. Should I remove those palms. Here's my rule on the palms. We can actually do visually, not just on radio, but if a palm tree is supposed to have people you're watching, you know, that kind of shape, I call it up the up 45 degree angle. Some of them can be a little more 90 degrees, but any palm that's flopped, we need to cut those off. That's in the nine rules of freeze recovery. And then we're going to have to have patience on a boatload of palms. I mean, seems like every variety that it is still alive and you know it by looking in the core, no one is showing in 30 days signs of reemergence of new fronds. And because we know it usually takes till April anyway. So this freeze really has put everything on hold on that. But the minute you start seeing new fronds emerging from the crown and then having, and they get a chance to lay out a little bit, you can take every other brown one off. I like to leave the brown looking palm fronds that are in their normal position, leave them alone until we know new growth is coming out. Yeah, so I had that, and they were sort of cool looking because all the fawns were blonde, and they, yeah. they were sort of pretty. Uh, they, they were sort of aesthetic, um, but my guy cut them back, which which is cool though. But in the middle, I can see growth, but I can tell it's going to take a while. So, um, is there a particular root fertilizer you'd recommend for wax myrtles, or maybe how do you feed these? How do you feed your wax myrtles? I feed them leftover lawn food. Mine personally. The, whenever okay. I found 25 plus years ago, I guess now, the beauty of, and I didn't know about it when I was working for Texas A&M University, but that was the job I had with Ag Communications before I came down here. And I got to listen to the likes of Bill Zach and John Burrow extol the virtues of this 312, 412 lawn food that A&M had actually developed a long time ago. And so when I started using that on my lawns, I got really good at all this stuff too. I learned the schedule along with everybody. Where was I going with this? There was one point you had you had a question. Well, it was about feeding the wax myrtles, and you were saying to oh, use lawn. Okay, so <laughs> thank you. But I figured out then to save a few uh, coffee cans. Back when we actually did coffee cans 25 mm-hmm. years ago, now these packaging on all our coffees. But you, you'd, I'd save a can here and I'd save a can there of something like Nitrofoss Super Turf because it greens up grass. Well, it'll green up evergreens so you think of the wax myrtle as an evergreen you can do it on pine trees you can do it on oak trees i did it on sago palms and then of course i did it on wax myrtles and ligustrums and all the evergreen plants so i just save leftover lawn food well we have a lot more focused feeding going on and they do make tree and shrub fertilizers but darn if you don't look at the analysis and it says something like 1648 so i was like always if you have if you're fertilizing the lawn per our schedule Always save a few cans of that stuff, but I have no problem with you doing any type of tree and shrub, shrub fertilizer either. And then one more thing is the any organic fertilizer is good for feeding an evergreen or feeding per my deep root feeding schedule of hardwood trees. So just always look for those 15, 5, 10s. The, I like the slower release ones. That's the 19, 4, 10. We used to endorse one with a 19, 5, 9, 18, 4, 6. So you see the higher nitrogen, that's what's good for the evergreens. Because of you today, we almost lost the client because, I'm going to tell you why, but since we're on this topic of lawn to some degree, because he goes, oh, I got to get out there and weed and feed my lawn. And I went, don't you dare. Don't you dare weed and feed. This is how you feed. This is how you weed. So I think when you want to also be clear about this, when you're talking about this lawn food, you're not going to put a weed and feed on these. On these, oh, yeah. on these wax bars. Yeah, that's yeah. thank you for I mean, bringing that up, Richard. But uh, here's the reason I don't like weed and feeds because the main, uh, let's use Scott's bonus S as the perfect example. 
Its active ingredient, if you don't know, this is known as atrazine. I've written about it for 20 years. We know what a heinous mm -hmm. chemical it is. It kills the root systems of nearby trees and shrubs. It's really bad for the groundwater because they can't siphon it out. They can't filter it out for some reason, the type of active ingredient it is. And people that scatter weed and feeds with atrazine all over the yard, that water is running into our groundwater system, our rainwater system, and know that that atrazine has got harmful chemical reactions to it on wildlife, yeah, especially like amphibians and reptiles. It's well known to cause birth defects on them. So why are we allowing that if it's burning tree root systems and it's bad for the environment? Because it's just such a huge, they got a, somebody up in Congress has got the ears of most of the congressmen about, congressmen about this active ingredient. It's so needed for the agricultural community. And it's really not. And it causes too many problems, but it shows you what a big company Scott's is and what, frankly, hypocrites Scott's is. They went on this huge, let's get an organic campaign for the last no oh, dozen years or so. And yet the the thing they pull, pour the most money into advertising campaign year after year, because it's their biggest money maker, is Scott's Bonus S. That's the product with atrazine. So Richard nailed it on the head. We're going to feed our lawns and then we're going to treat the weeds as we see them and need, need to. If your lawn is 100% weeds anyway, your soil is in really bad shape. You need to start changing as Ro Richard started this whole conversation. The bones of every bit of our successful gardening has to do with the soil. And yes, in the lawn, it starts in the soil. Well, Scott uh, is one of the top performing stocks this year. And the CEO right. is uh, happy as heck because everybody's using weed and feed. Um, Okay, so now that hard freezes are more common in Houston, another question. What plants should we consider buying that can survive the freeze? I know that's a pretty Okay, if you're broad, shopping like it's going to freeze in February of 2021, that week, for, what was it, 15th through the 19th, below freezing weather for that entire week and several hours below 17 degrees for most of the greater Houston area. Um, oh, by the way, I was talking to an Aggie buddy of mine and I was passing through the A&M area earlier this week and got to say, hey, how, how low did it get? He goes, it was zero degrees with a minus three wind chill in Bryan College Station on the heart of that freeze. I bring that up to tell you, do not go into shopping saying because that died, that oleander died, I'll never plant an oleander again because that bottle brush died, I'll never buy another bottle brush. Um, I'm not going to be alive the next time this happens in the Houston area. Statistically speaking, it has happened last time was 1989. Before that was 1954. And before that, it was like 1919. So there's usually at least 30 year stretches in between these kind of ridiculous freezes when it gets down to 10 degrees on the average for seven, eight hours. That's happened 89, 54, 1919. I may be off a year down there, but that's more than 30 years. Um, if you approach planting based on what happened in February, you're going to miss out on a lot of great stuff. So I don't discourage planting those things that got toasted big time, but also look into some other ones The there are, I can't even tell you all of them, but I don't even have it. Can you have sad this is? I don't even have a copy of the book to kind of show and tell because the one you're giving all your clients. Yeah. When you go in there, you, I love people to make lists. Tell me what you think you like. And then I'll, I've been at your property. This is what I do with my consulting business. So they put a little, I have a little skin in the game. Me telling somebody that X, Y, and Z are the best plants to plant is not the smartest move because what I like, you may not like. And what I like, you may not like. And you like, not. it's always going to be messed up on what people like. So I don't make one or two suggestions unless those two or three suggestions are in a list they bring me saying these are the ones i researched and uh, i love doing that with my consulting clients because i inevitably hear back from 95 percent of them and the first thing they did is i did my due diligence i like these nine plants for my front yard and i'll pick out the top three for them and i know are going to look good and i know they're going to be i don't say freeze avoiding because most of the time we are going to get some freezes and you have to have some that have great bounce back ability my favorite bounce back ability plant of all time is called the Jatropha. And the Jatropha, I don't care if it freezes. I don't even cover it anymore. It's going to freeze down the ground. And it's going to grow up four feet in the next two months. And it's going to get its beautiful red blooms. So a whole like list. Oh, I got an idea. To answer a question, this is not the new book. This is my old book. Which <laughs> By the way, I'll have it for sale this weekend. Which we have copies of those too. By the way, who, anybody who wants a copy of uh, 
Yeah, anybody wants a copy of Randy's old book, we've got that too. We just want to, we'll, we'll talk about how to get the book once we get closer. Okay, to so I'm going to read to you yeah. what I call, these are my bounce back ability plants real quickly. The Jatropha listed number one right there. Uh, angels, trumpets will bounce back from freezes. They may not bounce back quickly from this freeze. Uh, Esperanza, also known as yellow bells, painted begonias, pineapple sage, shrimp plant. Ah, uh, my shrimp plant. Rosemary, we were talking about earlier. Turks caps, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and any type of ginger, variegated or not, they always come back. Claridendrums, sago palms usually come back. Blue plumbago, another great one. And then one more for total shade coming back from this freeze. Ligularia should come back big time. All right. Well, thanks. A lot of great information. And again, you've got copies of Randy old book, which is still a great book. It doesn't mean it's outdated. We've got new book. So um, we'll, we'll get you some idea how to get a copy of the book. Um, now, something called Confederate roses. How do you know if a Confederate rose is still alive? I don't know how your, your rose I acting in. I found uh, Althea or a confederate rose that are in the hibiscus family, the rose family, actually. Um, I haven't found a dead one yet. They're already re-emerging re all over the place. So this goes back to do the test, cut to see if you see green in the outside bark, because if you're not seeing any green on the outside bark, you're probably can rest assured that it's dead down to the roots. But, you know, Althea and confederate rose, they come back from freezes very easily. So that root okay. system's still alive. Then that's a valuable enough plant to wait on. Got it. Got it. So dollar weed, obviously people are going through with weeds and all that. What's the best way to get rid of these dollar weeds? Well, mostly most of the people who have dollar weed are people that use weed and feeds in and every year <laughs> because they're ruining the, that soil and dollar weed loves the ruined soil. So you can always, when you have an, a hefty amount of dollar weed, I can tell you your soil is in really bad shape to begin with. And so you're going to have to find a way to rebuild that soil. But I do have a technique I have talked about many times on the air. You need to get two, actually three, if you follow this protocol, three different Bonide products. B-O-N-I-D-E is the name of the company. And most of the people that sell the fertilization schedule products that I talk about also carry most of the Bonide products. You can say Bonide, we're on webinar, but Bonide, Bonide, doesn't matter how you say it, that's their mm -hmm. website too. The, you need a granular product called Weed Beater Complete. You need a liquid product right now while it's still cool, we don't have like 88 degree highs, Bonide Weed Beater Ultra, and then the surfactant is Bonide Turbo. And if you get those three things and you follow the instructions on ounces per gallon of water for treatment and then read the turbo bottle will say how much of that bottle to put in there for per gallon control measures then you're going to wet all the blades of the dollar weed whatever broadleaf weed you have out there and then you're going to scatter the bonide weed beater complete because it has a little bit of broadleaf weed killing capacity when it touches wet blades so we're going to wet it with the weed killer so we get the double kill on that and then the Bonide Weed Beater Complete is also a pre-emergent herbicide to keep the seeds of the dollar wheat from regenerating as well. And it's funny, we mentioned the beach house. It was the one thing I did at the beach house because I, every time I'd come back in the spring, be covered up with dollar weed, I'd do my treatment, I just said, and a week later, there'd be no more dollar weed and the grass that was there came emerging through. But the reason it came back year in and year out is I didn't do the schedule. I never did the schedule down in Galveston. <laughs> because I didn't want to work the property. So I just let it mother nature run its course. And the fact that it's such sandy soil there naturally, it that is a perfect invitation to dollar weed. So let's go back to the original concept. You got to improve the soil. So once you clean this all up, do what you have to do. It goes back to getting the soil healthy, whether you're using composting or however you're doing this, but making sure you're following the schedule and getting the soil in shape. Uh, yes. Lawn grubs. Got a question about lawn grubs. I've been hurting my plants for years. How do we get rid of these little, oh, well, buggers? These little SOBs? Yeah, little um, little buggers. If you really are seeing grubs year in and year out, I'd be shocked if you found me a live grub right now. <laughs> the reason I say that is this freeze will have a beneficial effect on some insects. When I say beneficial effect, reduce their populations. Anything in the worm category, 
Caterpillar category, I think that there's no way they overwintered anywhere. On the flip side, the ants went down further in the soil to stay alive. And oddly enough, because it was raining before the big hard freeze, mosquitoes had laid their eggs in water. It froze over. But as soon as they warmed up, those embryos became alive again for those eggs. And they've been hatching mosquitoes in places that had standing water prior to the freeze. It's been a hoot. But I have noticed a decline in certain insects. And I think that if you have grub problems, maybe it's something else that's the problem because the grubs just aren't there after the freeze right now. And they haven't regenerated decimating numbers in one month. That's just impossible. I'm not an entomologist, but I play one on the radio. Well, you bring up a sort of a bugger from last year, sawed webworms. They were the bane of my existence. They would not die. And I know a lot of people have had issues with these. So you're thinking, even though I see moths sort of coming up in the grass and I get these chills down my spine, like, oh my gosh, are they the zombies of the insect world? Or, I mean, are sod worms something we will need to worry about? Or you think for this year, they're, they cold pretty much knock them out? I, I, I have, the longer I've been doing this, the less I try to predict things like that. I mean, come on, Richard. We were telling everybody February 3rd to get busy per the schedule that we were done with freezing That's weather. True. And the statistical data on February 3rd to a 15 day out showed nothing like what happened to us. So it caught a lot of people, weather people, including myself, by surprise. So I don't make a lot of predictions these days. I'm going to I'm going back on, believe it or not, a little bit of true entomology knowledge I had from working my days in agricultural communications and Sod webworms were supposed to be a cyclical insect that their populations couldn't handle certain weather events like freezes like we just had. So if there's a, a good enough freeze every year, it kind of keeps them away. This, If this does not wipe out the sod webworm population, the answer, simple answer to your question is, yeah, they're here with us forever. But <clears throat> if you go back and look at the years before I ever came on the garden line where they had sod webworm infestations, they were like on an eight or nine year cycle. And then whatever's happened in the last four or five years is just they haven't left. And we have not had that hard of a freeze. So I'm very hopeful that there's how could a worm or caterpillar outside, even under a leaf, survive that freeze mm -hmm. if it's soft bodied insect. <laughs> I guess we're going to find out, right? Now, let me put a little <laughs> bit of, um, what do I call it? A little feel-good moment for you about when you walk the lawn right now, if you see moths, I'll guarantee you they're not sod webworms at all. There are several okay. other moths that do their business for a very short amount of time. And there's leaf hoppers that have a moth-like effect when they flutter up. And people think that's the sod webworm moth because they, they as they walk through, you see these leaf hoppers. Leaf hoppers are very well, I'm going to say totally harmless, but they may chew up grass blade here and there and make it a little brown on the edge, but we're mowing, no big deal. So I don't worry about leaf hoppers, and I don't worry about the normal seasonality of little tiny moths here and there. When we're supposed to worry about sod webworms, it's statistical too, but we start about August. August, September, October, those are the three worst. Well, okay, so there's a question here about my split leaf philodendron split and had gushy stuff, ew, that's good, um, coming out of it. So they removed it. Should we cut them back? Will they come back? I guess if it's Yeah, that was and... actually rule number one in the nine rules of freeze recovery. If it's mushy, gushy, ooey, or gooey, you need to cut back till you see layers. And if that means you're cutting back to the total soil level, that's fine. Because these split leaf philodendrons should come back. Um, I, will, I wished I was gonna be at a prop, I'm gonna be at a property tomorrow that I could give you a total update on the perfect split leaf in its story, whether it survived or not, but I'm not going to be at that property until tomorrow. But I have a feeling I'm going to find some new growth because it had such great soil around it for so many years. Okay. Well, that's that ochi gushy stuff. I'm glad I ate dinner. My multi-trunk wax myrtle has brown leaves still hanging on one trunk. Leaves dropped off the other. What does that mean? I have to see it to understand it and kind of interpret, but if a wax myrtle's leaves are brown and they're still hanging on, that part is probably dead to do a cutback till you see green wood on that. But I haven't seen a wax myrtle massacre because of the freeze. They, they've all survived. 
You know what I noticed, and I may be wrong, you're, you're the expert, but I noticed people get hesitant to cut back so much, even until they see the green. And I've had to put it, I've had to have like this out of body experience and just cut until I see the green. Like, like there's some psychological thing that doesn't want you to cut back so much. But once you start doing that, then you start to see whether or not this thing is really alive or not. Just, you're right. I mean, you, you nailed it. There is a lot of resistance to pruning all these these dead things. And they're think that one, it's just no knowledge of how a plant's going to grow. They think it'll grow back from the tops and it has to grow back from the root system. And so they're, they're thinking if you cut all this back, you're ruining its chance to bounce back. Well, I, I mean, it's a little bit errant thinking, but, you know, I, they also haven't studied botany or biology. It is understandable why people are hesitant because they want to wait things out. The, what's the other reason, right? Well, because they're so leafless, so many things are leafless and everything, they don't want to leave stumps either. And I, this is yeah. me with the sago palms. I wished everybody wasn't cutting them all back all at once right now because they leave these just stalks, trunks, three, four feet high and looking just brown and gray. There's just, there's nothing attractive about it. The back to the sago palm or the palm tree rule. Well, on sago palms, as long as they're 90 degrees and up. So here we go again. You want those fronds to lay out. And if that's the case, leave the yellow ones there until new green ones emerge from the center. And you won't leave these little stumps all over the place. I can handle the brown, yellowish fronds for a while. As long as they're not flopped over, then those you have to get rid of. But there, people are hesitating. Another good note. Richard, people are hesitating to prune for three different reasons right now. Two of them kind of related to the freeze and one just because of the lack of knowledge. I think I'm going to put Easter bonnets on my sago stumps. What do you think? Doesn't that look sort of cute? I, you know what? There's got to be a trend to like decorate them like Mr. Potato Heads. <laughs> Somebody's going to start <laughs> finding out a way to decorate these, make it look like cartoon figures in front of a subdivision. Or yeah, Texas, Texas snowmen. Um, all right, now knockout roses. Are rock knockout roses hardy? Mine are doing great following the freeze. In other words, are they usually a hardy rose for people the to consider? Roses, yeah. Knockout. Uh, been fun to see these roses that look like they're just really going strong right now. And after the freeze, knowing how bad it tore everything else up. So, you know, uh, tip of the hat to roses. I've seen a lot of people just roses, not knockout roses. But knockout rose, if you treat it like it is a rose and feed it every 30 days with rose food and make sure that you prune them a few times a year, don't just let them go dormant, not dormant, what's the word I'm looking for? They'll, the knockout rose will throw a ton of blooms at one time. And then when those shut down, you have these little gray and brown little twigs hanging around and the, the dead plant life material, the petals, wherever, they, wherever they're sitting, the, the rose actually bloom is sitting in. And those things look horrible. So you have to prune several times a year because you're feeding aggressively. The people that have figured out knockout roses, that it, it, while it's still a hedgerow and they like to prune it for shape, it's the people that are just putting a knockout rose thinking they're getting a rose and not understanding it's a hedgerow. It rose, it has to be pruned more than three times a year if you really want it to look right. All right. So this is a pretty general question, but um, I think this is a good one. Can you rank your top three popular palm trees? No, not that's a great question. I'm, it's not that I'm stumped. It's that I don't have enough information yet about which ones lived and which ones didn't. I know okay. the windmill palms did really good. I know the cabbage palms did really good. I know most of the mule palms did really good. I am impressed with how sturdy the Sylvestries came through this, but I can't rank them just yet. It's a great question. It's worth a tip sheet when I do have all my answers from all my palm tree experts out there over the next, I need to wait till the end of April for sure. Hopefully we'll see which ones bounce back with new fronds the quickest. That's going to be another way to rank them in the future. I just would stay away from anything in the, what's called the Robolini family of palms. Those are, those are the ones that look horrible right now they're the really tall ones I and mean, you know they're dead every single one of the fronds is flopped over 100 feet in the sky mm -hmm. those are the ones that didn't make it yeah they look terrible i don't know what people are going to do now speaking of trees of people that are trying to uproot massive trees that have died 
what do you think are the best trees for people to have for like shade? What would you suggest? And I, and I, and I know it's very precarious. I see about how to plant the trees. You got some great tips about what to do on how to plant the trees. Is there a vendor in town that actually will plant the trees the way you recommend in the books? Absolutely. Actually, they have their own ways to it, but it, it either replicates or is even better than mine. You don't ever want to hire a tree company that let's just say they dig the hole the same size of the root ball in question. You know, you're dealing with the wrong company then, but you know, nurseries and garden centers like RCW nurseries, uh, verdant tree farms. I I've been impressed with how many trees even Beverly started carrying at the Arbor gate in the last two years, because there, there are yeah. tree farms you can also work with all over the greater Houston area. And I mentioned one in verdant tree farm, but uh, U.S. Trees of Texas, RCW Nursery, the nursery, well, their parent company truly is a tree farm, and it's up in Plantersville. So while they sell those trees to other nurseries and garden centers for resale purposes because they're a farm, you know they're only bringing the best samples down from the farm down to their nursery at 249 in Beltway. So the bigger, my, a lot of the independent nurseries and garden centers I talk about will smell, smell. they'll sell small trees but uh, you, the nice size ones, so you can have instant gratification, you're going to get from a tree farm or a nursery related to a tree farm. Someone's thinking about composting. How do I get started? This is not a, something that I do. I call Green Pro and they do it. But if someone really wants to have the initiative to do it, uh, what? Okay, wow, that's, that's a deep discussion. Do you have the real time to go through compost discussion. If you're going to make your own compost because you want to have it ready for compost top dressing or filling in other beds like a vegetable bed, you need your compost. You need at least about eight feet, if not a little bit more length, maybe eight by four. So you can make actually two compost piles because you're going to have finished product in one and then you're going to keep working the other. But I, I promise you this, psst, the internet is filled with composting 101 websites, just filled with it. You could go do a Google search. I love doing this from time to time. Take something as simple as compost piles 101. There will be over a million hits, I guarantee you. <laughs> it's like, and the top three, there are websites totally dedicated to getting people started building their own compost pile. And if you have the space, definitely do it, all right? If you're asking about do-it-yourself compost top dressing treatments, it can be done. You and your you, know, you and your kids and a rake or two can spread this stuff on its own. You just buy several bags of it if you're a do-it-yourselfer, and you make these tiny little even piles equally spaced apart, and then you get the kids start raking everything in so you can blend it together from pile to pile. That's compost top dressing. It only goes down about a half an inch, if not, what would you say? What What's between one quarter and a half an inch? Five-eighths? No. Yeah, yes, five-eighths. There's a space in there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So but somewhere between you just got to make sure you're putting it. That's the kind of amount of stuff not a lot. start doing in the soil. I notice people who can really spend the time and do their own composting, have the room to do it. They do a great job, but it's a lot of work. I mean, I think it's great. Um, but I, thanks for the tip about that the internet will give you the wealth of information that you need. You can spend hours on a radio show and it bore the heck out of most people but spend hours talking about what goes in and what doesn't go in a compost pile how how's your carbon to nitrogen ratio do we need 30 to 1 still who wants 60 to 1 these days i pose that i'm finding something in the middle at 38 to 1 it's but you got to get to know the carbon to nitrogen ratios and every single one of those websites at compost 101 will nail it for you all right well here's, this could be possibly for composting and i hear a lot of good and mostly bad about this. So this is a good question for you. Do coffee grounds really nurture a garden? Why or why not? Yes, because they've got a lot of nitrogen and acid in them and sulfur, natural sources. So that greens plants up. You, it's the dose is the difference thing. Most people that save coffee grounds and use it, they don't use it every week. They don't use it every month. But I'm, I prefer the answer to that is once a season on something because you can overdo the coffee grounds and get so much acid around the root system of the plants, you'll essentially burn it all up. But coffee grounds are good once a couple times a year. Uh, things like roses, okay. azaleas, uh, it'll work on hibiscus too. Anything in the rose family, pretty much anything in the rhododendron family, which the azalea is, it will work on that. 
but you people tend to overuse it, abuse it, misuse it when it comes to everything else other than those types of plants I mentioned. Oh, and keep it around because it's great for a compost pile. <laughs> yeah, it's one of one of the ingredients for composting, right? Um, is this a good year to plant bulbs, considering yes. the freeze? The title of that tip sheet. March is the new February. February is a great time for planting bulbs, depending on what they are. Some of them should have been planted back in December, maybe January. Tulips, but yeah, all the bulbs you can find right now, uh, now that the temperature is getting warmer and warmer, everything's going to start popping. So make sure you work the soil up really good. Follow them. Like again, you could Google search like bulb planting techniques. and It'll tell you how big is the bulb, how much deep you go into the soil. And I think it's half, a, uh, what is it? One and a half again the size of the bulb. So if my bulb is two inches long, then I need to do four inches plus down in the soil. But I think it's something like that. But it's all, again, so easy to find online when it comes to bulb planting techniques. But I'd get busy like yesterday. How do you dig up an oleander tree? That is a question. Well, I don't, and hopefully you don't. You hire a crew with all the money you getting in benefits and dividends from working with Richard and his staff, but they've got to be dug out. They, they are legitimately going to have to be axed out. And so this is elbow grease work. And I, I know what jobs to avoid by today's standards. I truly do. Uh, I used to love to get in there and do things with pickaxe and everything. So a lot smarter now, know how to save the back. At nearly 60 years old, I did not need to be throwing my back into any type of turmoil. This is Randy Lemon broadcast. That does seem like upside a upside down in my brain. Oh God, don't get me started. But that does seem like something you want to outsource. Absolutely, really, and not hand along your. And same thing okay, with well, the well, here, Japanese blueberries. And that they're, that they're not the kind of trunk that. How do I say? Some trunks, hardwood trees, stump grinding the machine that stump grinds, it's a natural for those hardwood trees. But when you try to stump grind something that's more fibrous, um, more wet naturally inside, then a stump grinder, it gets junked up, gunked up, and then they can't finish the job. They have to come back another time. So again, Japanese blueberry is going to have to be dug out by hand, axed out if at all possible, unless you just get, I mean, got sharp, sharp shovels and you have about, you know, half a dozen employees on site and just going to town on those roots. All right. Well, we're coming down to the end of the questions, but here's a good one. And I think, again, I don't know what kind of fertilizer or what we're looking to fertilize. I'm assuming it's lawn. Uh, what fertilizer do you use? One of the things that I'm very proud to do for this market, and it's why gardening is so local, is more, more local than politics, right? I like to support the local. So when it comes to synthetic for my normal schedule, the synthetic fertilizer that's on the very top of the list is Nitrofoss Super Turf. And it's available at those nurseries, those garden centers, the feed stores we endorse, and all the greater Houston Ace retailers as well. And that gets it in enough people's hands to to please what we've been doing on Garden Line for a long time. But we used to talk about other 15510s, uh 18.59s, those type of things from different companies who were out of California or out of Oklahoma. And one other, I forget where its home base was, but Fertilome is a big national company. And we we just don't recommend those anymore while they're still available because they're just not available in big numbers. And by supporting Nitrofoss, we're supporting a very big local business in a great way to keep us in the right, keep our hands filled with the right fertilizers. Flip side of that, organically speaking, I highly recommend the MicroLife products because they too are local. They're based right here at the company called San Jacinto Environmental. And all they care about is putting out all the different types of organic fertilizers. And so the best all purpose organic out there is definitely MicroLife 624's green label if you wanna to choose to do a schedule organically. I have both the synthetic and the organic schedule online at randylemon.com. You can click right on that big headline that says fertilization schedule, scroll into that, down at the bottom is the organic schedule and down the bottom is a PDF file you can print out, put it on your kegerator, <laughs> your inside fridge and stay true to the schedule. And it does mention what type of products in that schedule we kind of recommend here and there. And one last thing, going back to Nitrofoss, it was almost nine years ago they came up with their version of an organic fertilizer. 
And I, when it first came out, I didn't think anything of it because it's like, why would I want to mention nitrophos to an organic schedule like that when we have other organic fertilizers we'll recommend? He goes, that's not. He goes, just try it. Tell me what you think. And that was the story at the birth of sweet green from nitrophos. Sweet green is 1104. It's great for turf and bat, that's about it because it's got no other nutrients in there. It's just organic nitrogen and it works fast and it does green things up as the name says. So I like anything from microlife. I like anything from uh, nitrophos on the different sides of the equation, but there's others in between. There are a lot of other liquid fertilizers and everything. So to me, you, if you're asking me what my favorite fertilizer, Randy, well, that's my country voice living out in the country. It, it depends on what you're trying to feed. It depends on what you're trying yeah. to recover. But when, it, if that question right. is, and you have to, if you ask me the question, what do you, what fertilizer do you recommend? You don't, that'll never make it on the air. That'll never make it on the air because I've been recommending the same fertilizers since day one that I've been doing garden line and that hasn't changed. And I wished everybody would get on the local type schedules and stop buying the national Scotts type company, no offense to their stock, but yeah, they're nationwide and that product does its job. It kills weeds, but what they don't tell you is really scary. I would love everybody to go read the bag of a back, back of a bag of weed and feed tomorrow when you get a chance or Saturday when you're out and about. Flip that thing over. All the warnings and hindrances and the CYA verbiage from the lawyers at Scotts, it's just amazing. No one would ever use it if they read the back of a bag of weed and feed with atrazine. I'll tell you, I've been following your schedule always for the last five years or so. And that nitrophos product is is great. But you know, I still have to go to the I still have to go to the schedule and look at the dates, look at what the mix I need, and I go and I get it. And I mean it never fails. I mean, it's it really uh has is a really great product. So it has helped. I have no it, I have no economic interests in financial interests in nitrophos, but they are very impressive. Um, all right. When are the best times to run my sprinkler system? So I actually you have I one. You need to go read online free of charge today. Okay. If you go to randylemon.com and that can get you to the garden line webpage, you're going to go to the archives and then scroll down alphabetically and do irrigation basics. Read that because it's temperature related mostly around here based also on what rain we are or are not getting so you have to kind of go based on the temperature times like the, right now we're barely doing things like once a week both landscape and the lawn right. because we've had some ample rains in between so we always have to keep that in mind there's not a one size fits all answer to that because that irrigation basics tip sheet will teach you how to go out and find out what it's going to take per zone for you to reach a certain amount that is actually needed on a weekly basis. That's why the tip sheet is so handy. No, and I use the tip sheet. Uh, one question I would ask about this is, is it better to, once you have the, the, the right schedule for the right time of the year and, and the weather, like to your point, right now, you, you rarely need it. Is it best early in the morning or later in the evening that you would Good run question. Yeah. your sprinklers? In? Always best early in the morning for several reasons. Always statistically when there's less wind, bar none. Go outside some morning at 6, 6.30 for straight week. Unless a storm is actually coming through, <laughs> it is always best to run your irrigation system in the morning because the hotter it gets, the more evaporation. So waste happens and even late in the day. And then you always need to be out of the habit. You should never water the lawn late in the day going into nighttime hours because that's when they start to develop fungal diseases. So that's why early in the mornings is always best. I'll tell you, the people that, one, use the sprinklers at noon, those drive me crazy. The other ones are the ones who, when it's pouring out and the sprinklers are still running. That bothers me. All right. Um, I feel you pain. How should I treat it? Yeah, I, how should I treat aphids in my flower bed? Can you be more specific? I mean, it's usually on one plant always. Hmm. If someone but wants to add, whoever asked that question. Well, here's another one before we get to that one, and then we'll be sort of coming to the end of our questions. Uh, what gardening tools should every homeowner have? Ooh, did you bait me with this? I think everybody should I get did. back to cutting their own dang lawns. 
So if I'm going to start a campaign and get everybody to do what, you know, do what I do, not just what I say, get your own lawnmower, right? That way you're not spreading weeds, seeds, and diseases per other people's, other crew's lawnmowers. Plus, you're also going to be able to cut it right. How many times you have to, I used to have to remind my lawn mowing crew that when I had a house in Cyprus, you have to raise your mower up here. And when you come mm-hmm. here, do not cut it the same height you're cutting everybody else's lawn with. And again, that's why you should be cutting your own lawn because most of the crews are lazy enough to not raise it up on because that's work because they love cutting it short because the more short they cut it in the summer times, the less that grass is going to go, period, because it's so stressed out from the heat. So it's just like eh, just laying there and not growing upright. And they love that because that's less work for them to have to cut through. So don't right. get me wrong. There's a, a there's an evil back plan to all this. And that's why I love for people to get back into the yard themselves. Landscaping yourself definitely gets you to be able to use more native things like native mulches instead of the same black dyed mulch purveyor in your subdivision. And black mulch is horrific looking. It looks heinous. It looks tacky. And especially against white houses or like gray stucco houses, it just stands out. And I got to use this line the other day in a seminar. So I'll do it here. This is no cuss words, but there's the very... <laughs> bad b-class movie called up the academy i think it was uh ralph macchio's second hit uh, to be in hollywood but the main actor this kind of colonel for the school always liked to say that stands out like a turd in a punch bowl and i'm sorry but that's how i look at dyed and black mulch and sometimes even red mulch but the colored mulch is that heinous looking you need to change it so if we're back to doing it ourselves we got a mower a wheelbarrow a steel tine rake a leaf rake, and I said blower, right? That's kind of where I'd start and make sure that I can, and a shovel, so I can work with the soils and the beds. But uh, you don't may not need the, the uh, if everything else is fairly normal and all you're worried about is the lawn, you don't need the wheelbarrow. But that wheelbarrow comes in handy for people who like to compost, t- top dress themselves, so they can plop little tiny even piles all over the yard with bulk compost in a situation like that. But you want to change how lawns look, get everybody back to mowing their own lawns. And uh, every one of those people that mow their own lawn and do all their fertilization schedule themselves, those are the greenest yards on the block in the Houston area per that schedule. I'm not saying it because I wrote the schedule. Schedule was an amalgamation of great advice I'd gotten from true experts in the industry for the longest, like five year stretch. And this came up and we've only made one major adjustment to it. We added trace minerals this time. Uh, and you don't even have to do that. It's optional, but it just show you that I know everybody that's had good success with our schedule loves to come on and brag about it. So, you know, it's something that'll benefit you. Richard's already backed me up on that too. Well, and the one thing about the mulch that does drive me crazy because I never knew about it until I started listening to you and the black mulch. I mean, it's pervasive. Everybody gets the colored mulch. So one is what's the best type of mulch? Now you can mulch right now, right? This is a good time, but well, what's the best? What's the best mulch that Oak you should mulches you should that consider? have names like double shredded, native, native shredded, native double shredded, aged native, aged double shredded. In the word aged, double shredded, composted mulch, or anything in the Texas native category, and you can get it in bulk or bags several places around this area, but you're not going to find it from bags only at a big box store bags of mulch at the big box store are the worst offender than the crews that convince the neighbor and the neighbor and the neighbor and they all do the same mulch for the same guy gives them a great deal but every single one of those is uh dyed mulch i think somebody could create a business i don't know if you have young people you try to advise on creating a new business just go get yourself 18 wheelers full of really good native mulch and go to these subdivisions and say, we're going to improve your look and you're going to fire that crew and don't let them put another stick of dyed mulch down again. And somebody can make a fortune. I'm too old and lazy to do kind of work anymore. So I'm giving that idea out there to the universe. So somebody will create a mulching service above and beyond these dyed mulch services that are going on out there. It is it's disgusting for someone like me to look at when I drive in. It's just one dyed mulch after another, knowing how poisonous this is for the soil. Well, and that's what I want to bring up because people might be asking, well, what's wrong with it? But to your point, it is damaging the soil and your trees. It's, it's sort of like putting poison into your into your root system, isn't it? Uh, yeah, with look, whatever the they're using. It, that- I don't know if this is analogously perfect, but it's dyed with some. And my 
always the first argument from anybody that's in that industry goes, it's a natural dye. It's it's made from soybeans or whatever it's made from. It's organic. It's still a dye. And that dye is concentrated and it is leaching through the soil. So it is damaging the root system. It's da damaging the microbiology of the soil with natural for lack of a better word, natural worms and caterpillars, the microscopic ones, it kills those. <laughs> and so you don't get that benefit to the root system anymore. A good native mulch, shredded mulch, is already breaking down and helping the soil as it breaks down even further. Dyed mulch is also usually more chunky wood than anything dirt in there because you can't dye the dirt. So the shredded hardwood mulches or the dyed mulches are made out of mostly like landscape timbers and uh, pallets and and topped up some trees. So this is not aged. It's not de decomposing to become compost eventually. That you should be looking for. And one last thing, if you absolutely need dark, then just use compost as your mulch. That will keep its color mm -hmm. longer and you're adding to the soil. You're not poisoning the soil. I That's what I do. I use compost as um, mulch. And it looks great. And I'm doing the right thing for the soil at the same time. So yes. it's, uh, it doesn't have that sort of look that people like, but it looks great. And I know I'm actually adding, I'm adding to the soil uh, using, using compost. Another good Randy tip I got from the radio show, if you haven't listened every weekend, I'm up with Randy Lemon, 6 to 10. Correct. And Saturdays and Sundays. So what? Right. Uh, one last thing, Rand. One last thing. Um, this has been, I mean, a tough year for you when busy with all the things that you had to, you had to do. Uh, any, any, any real lessons for you that you can bring to us from this whole freeze? Something that you went, oh, I never thought about this. That maybe you can share with everybody. Not to put you on the spot, but anything really interesting that you've observed through this. Um, I, I think the most interesting observation is if you'd put horticultural experts like me on trial years ago and say, which plants have made it through every freeze for this many years? And we had to keep strong on that because of it. I, I was like, to find out how many dead viburnums, oleanders, bottle brush, um, and I know I'm at, and these Japanese blueberries, we all as horticultural people were under the impression that they could pretty much handle any freeze we've ever had. So the depth of this freeze, that the length of this freeze is something we will probably never experience again in our Houston lifetimes. And if it does do 31, 32 years, I'll be 90 something, late 90s by then. So I'm not going to worry about it at all in replacing those. But, you know, I am shocked we're having to replace these. It just that's not the norm. And I also had to learn, you talk about learning behind the scenes and how the nurseries and garden centers have had to handle this because they're already behind because of COVID-19 being such a great year for nurseries and garden centers. It kept people buying more right. and more plants. Well, the growers didn't know how to predict that in February of 2020. So they weren't prepared for it. They are prepared now if it was still a COVID type year, but what they didn't expect was having to replace every single nursery in Texas as many times as they've had and just get them filled. I mean, I think I may have said this already, but it's, it has been interestingly fun for me to watch some of these garden centers open up and swarm of people. I'll give you one perfect example. It was, I was delivering to like a nursery or garden center that I didn't expect. Oh, it was Enchanted Gardens. Is on Enchanted Gardens at 359 and 723 South of Katy and on the northern part of Richmond. I got there as quick as I could because they opened up at 8. I got there like 8.05 and I was bringing boxes of books in there to help them restock the store. And it was interesting seeing all these people getting out of the car, about 24 people over about a five minute period. Already, you would have never seen that <laughs> up until this year. And so people are buying out plants after plants after plant. If shrubbery comes in and it's not looking perfect, it's still going out the door. It's kind of like a real estate market analogy. You know, it, it's, it is definitely a seller's market right now. There are so many people wanting to buy. Well, same thing it is definitely a seller's market, but they have to get replaced mm -hmm. constantly and the growers have not kept up with it. Yeah, no, it's, that's a great observation because I see that too when I go into uh, my local 
nursery and I can't find a place to park, uh, even though I'm the first one there in the morning, I'm like, who beat me here? Um, so it is interesting. Um, and again, I think if you all want, and thanks for everybody staying with us so long with Randy, we really appreciate it. And I hope you got some great information. Um, it's like money, I tell people, it starts with the soil, the basics. Uh, and Randy does such a great job helping everybody to keep things living, robust, and doing it the right way long term. It's a discipline. Your schedule, Randy, is a discipline, just like investing. If there's a discipline to what you do, but if you follow the discipline, the results show. Like you always tell people, follow the schedule for two years and see the lawn schedule, feeding schedule, and see what happens. And that's what I did. My, my lawn looked like the set of The Walking Dead when I bought this house. And it's great now. Um, so uh, for a copy of Randy's book, you're going to hear from Nikki. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, we've got, uh, we had a little bit of a situation at our office, a little bit of a flooding, but the books are good. Um, great book. It, we have they're the, all autographed. Um, they're all signed. Oh, they're all, oh, they all have Randy Lemon autographed. Uh, courtesy of us, RAA advisors. And we also have a copy of his former, the previous book, which is great too. Uh, still a lot of great information in that book, right, Randy? Obviously, yeah, I, I mean, still use it as a guide. There's about 20% overlap of information, but there's a whole bunch of other chapters in there like that bounce back ability chapter. And there's one a chapter sure. dedicated to the Texas Tough Palms. Uh, you can read through that and kind of determine what palms to plant in the future. Based couple that with this freezes information and it's going to be it's actually i am so thinking i need a backer i need somebody to back i want to redo this book and i've self-published my last four books so we only print x amount and once you know they're done in like three four years we just move on and try to write another book to with a bunch of different information but after what happened with the citrus and what happened with the palm trees i'm seriously consider redoing this book so we'll take the bones and there still be a few little overlap information pieces, but the Texas Tough Citrus, Texas Tough Figs, Texas Tough Avocados, those specific chapters were very well received. And so was the Palm chapter by a Palm expert friend of mine. But that was five years ago, five years plus that I wrote this book. And so we sold it for those two years. So if you have access, like Richard just said, ask for it because there's only, I only have 36 more in my possession, which I'm going to be selling at. Oh, can I, can I? Promote one thing if they want to come talk to me in person, and that is uh, this weekend at the Sci Fair Home and Garden Show at the Berry Center on Barker Cypress, south of two, uh, 290, north of Clay Road, north of 529, actually. Um, no, sorry, it's south of 529 now that I think about it. I don't even know. I don't remember. No, it's north of 529. My bad. But the Berry Center is a the big Taj Mahal to the Sci Fair tax dollars, school tax dollars. It's a wonderful place to do a home and garden show. And if you're wondering whether we've been getting out since COVID-19, we started doing book signings at Christmas time. They went really well. So we've been doing garden line appearances. Everybody masks up. We autograph some books and answer a lot of questions in person. Uh, I'll be there pretty much 1130 till three, both days, 1130 till three. I'll be doing the radio show right here from the house. And uh, I will head on over there for uh, well, as soon as the show's over at 10 o'clock, I'll get set up by 11. And then I'll, I'm supposed to be on for them at 12 noon, 12 to one for a seminar. And then before and after I'll have the books out there as well. And just a good chance usually for everybody to ask their question they've always wanted to ask in person. All right, so we got one more encore question, and then that's it. But it's from Tom. He wants to know where he can find Azalea Hardy gardenia. Well, that's actually a good question. I hate, on a okay. personal level, miniature gardenias. I just don't think they look right. They have never performed that well here, unless you made a significantly raised bed, and it was just those gardenias in the bed. That's why I've seen them do better in pots. But when they have any kind of competition around them, they yellow out, and they look sickly, and they don't flower. So where you get a regular gardenia, I, I do not keep up with everybody's ordering practices, plus with the fast movement. One of the first places I would look would be RCW Nursery because they are usually always filled with enough azaleas. So I would think that they also know the importance of the regular 
what we call heritage style gardenias because they do get fed the same way. My gosh, I never have luck with them. They just don't look good after a while. I mean, like for first week. Gardenias or you got it's a I, I, hate relationship. Same thing with things like magnolias. You either love them or you hate them. And horticulturally speaking, I, the reason I don't like gardenias is because if you are not present all the time, they'll get ravaged by a disease, by an insect, you name it, or you just forget about them. And so for years, no nutrients, and then you're wondering why it doesn't bloom. But it's those miniature gardenias. They're just the worst offender. They cannot handle the competition of anything near them at all. And one thing I'll add before we go, when you go to your local nursery, and there's, if you listen to Randy's show, he talks about a few of them. These people, when you ask them questions, it's amazing how helpful they are about what to do, the right things. Even I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty decent at this. I'm, no, I'm obviously no Randy, but they'll say, wait, hey, don't forget this. And don't overwater the lavender because this happens. And I mean, these people are just amazing from the local garden centers, the, the, the wealth of information uh, they provide. So uh, I, I am a big fan of them all, Arbor Gate and all of them. So uh, thanks, Randy. Thank you so much for spending time with our clients, helping them get their gardens and uh, flowers and everything in order after the freeze. And um, again, You'll be hearing from us so that you can get a copy, signed copy of Randy's new book and hopefully go out to see him uh, at the center as well. So thanks everyone. Thanks for attending. I'm Rich Rosso and uh, thanks again.